In late 1990, Neo Geo arcade machines began to be distributed across the United States. I remember seeing my very first one, the bright red cabinet grabbing my attention, and the fact you could select multiple games to play, kind of like the old Nintendo Play Choice machines years earlier. I wasn't overly familiar with the SNK name at that point, but it wasn't totally alien either. I recalled games like Akari Warriors and Alpha Mission being done by them, so my curiosity was piqued to see what this new Neo Geo was all about. As many of you know, the Neo Geo MVS was the arcade version of the venerable Neo Geo line. MVS stood for Multiple Video System, lending to the fact that it used replaceable cartridges in place of dedicated ROM boards like most arcade machines. Neo Geo cabinets came in a few different flavors. You could get them as a single game or have them support up to six different software cartridges in their deluxe packages. I was quite taken with a number of Neo Geo titles right away. The graphics were really good in most games and I always was one to appreciate sprite scaling effects. As more Neo machines began showing up around my hometown, my friends and I discovered games we sunk hours into trying to defeat. Being an arcade kid gave me a special appreciation for these games because they were challenging and were often quite easy to get into with the type of pick up and play quality you wanted in your action titles. Playing the Neo Geo in those early days was quite something, and in this episode we are going to take a look at the games that launched the device and were released throughout 1990. There are 10 games we are going to cover in this one, so let's get started. One of the very first games I'd play for the Neo Geo would be Baseball Stars Professional, a follow-up to the popular NES title. There are no real-world teams or players here, as was quite the norm at the time. But what it lacks in Major League appeal, it makes up for with a great playing game. You only need to worry about a few buttons and everything else moves along at a brisk pace to make sure you never get bored. The visuals were quite good at the time, showing off animation and color well beyond any home system at the time. Later Neo Geo baseball games would come along and destroy it visually, but this one still holds its own in the gameplay department. This one would also see a home version on the AES, so if you like a good arcade sports title, it's well worth picking up. For the rest of you, it's been released digitally on modern systems for under $10, a fraction of its original asking price. Get out of here! It's a homer out of here. The crowd and as he rounds the bases, he loves to egg that crowd on, and proud he should be. Out of all the early Neo games I'd play, none were as graphically exciting as Magician Lord. It had the feel of a Sega Genesis title on steroids. Loads of color, nice parallax, and some wicked cool scaling effects here and there. It was sort of a mix of a platformer and a running gun, with a dash of Altered Beast thrown in for good measure. You have power-ups you can get that transforms you into various warriors with different attacks. Take too much damage and you'll lose the new form. Levels are constructed with lots of verticality and of course, there is a big bad guy at the end of each area to defeat. Some of the later areas require a bit of exploration to get past. This game can be hard as hell too. I mean, there are areas that will wipe the floor with you the first few times through, and if you're the type to go for one credit wins, good luck with this one. I didn't care much back then though. It looked great and played just as well, so I kept coming back for more. I consider this one a Neo must-own, so whether you have an original MVS or AES hardware or choose digital, this one you just gotta play. I'm destined to die. NAM 1975 always reminded me of the Chuck Norris films of the 1980s. Your job is to infiltrate Vietnam, rescue a kidnapped scientist, and get out in one piece. It's played from the third person perspective with gameplay similar to Operation Wolf. You have a lot more to worry about here because you have to keep bullets, grenades, and missiles off your soldier. Luckily you have a dash flip to get yourself away from enemy fire and you have an arsenal all your own. 
it's actually quite tough to keep tabs on yourself, the enemies, the vehicles, and the munitions coming your way. The deeper you get, the faster things move, so this will likely chew up average players. If you're a fan of these types of games though, this was a solid entry with lots of cool little visual touches. Not my favorite Neo title, but I had a lot of fun with it. Top Player's Golf was the bane of my arcade existence back in 1990. I love a good game of golf and this one had so many cool touches. I love the way the entire screen scaled when you hit the ball. I really enjoyed how the gameplay was easy to get into and understand. I wanted to play it and enjoy it, but man was it unforgiving. I could go a few holes and do really well, only to have things fall apart with back-to-back -back triple bogeys. Most of the problem revolved around the meter they used for hitting the ball. It had a weird way of putting a spin on your shot to get it to go left or right. I never really came to terms with how it wanted me to use it, sometimes resulting in perfect hits, only to do something totally different the very next time. It ended up being a game I wanted so much to be good at, but it just ended up frustrating me more than anything else. Neo Turf Masters would come along and completely marginalize this entry and relegate it to the back burner of the Neo Library. Some love it, but I just couldn't adjust to that power meter at all. Green clubs to the right. It isn't hard to find a lot of hate online for Ninja Combat. The gameplay is a strange mix of run and gun and beat em up, and the visuals have a rather unappealing art style here and there. But in 1990 it was quite something to see. Lots of enemies on the screen and the two player mode was quite fun. As you defeated each of the first three stages you opened up a new playable character to join you in your quest. An evil demon has shown up and attacked New York and you must battle your way to the ninja tower that has appeared out of nowhere. The problems mainly start with the cheap hits that begin early and keep on coming. Enemies have a forward motion that mean if you get touched you get damaged, and since most take a few hits to drop, you'll see that continue screen quite a bit. No doubt this was done because it's really short and they wanted to score as many credits from you as possible. This is the type of game that if you play it alone you'll pick it apart for its flaws, but stands up much better in multiplayer. If you've got a buddy with you, it can still be a good one to play here and there. The first time I played Riding Hero, it pissed me off like you wouldn't believe. You see, this isn't just a racing game, it's a role-playing racing game, and my first time was with its story mode. As I fumbled around the map looking for someone to speak with, I hadn't noticed the timer running out at the top of the screen. That's right, dude, this game actually counted the time you spent on the map exploring. So the first time I played it, that's all I got. I never got a chance to race and the machine had the audacity to ask me for more credits after this bullshit. It really was a bad way to do an arcade game. It does have a straight to race mode, but that wasn't any better. One mistake meant you were shot back straight to last place and bumping another racer means you get rocked and slowed down while there is no damage to them at all. The story mode does get better as you play. Once you understand the map and setup, you basically race against low tier guys to earn money. Once you get a good bike, a decent purse, and some experience, you'll race as a professional. Visuals are kinda weak for a forward scrolling racer in 1990. It pales next to the super scalers from Sega and plays nowhere near as nice as Super Hang On, what's clearly inspired it. I don't know, first impressions can be really important to a game, and this one just never left me feeling like it deserved my money.
My friends and I loved the Super Spy. We sucked at it, but really enjoyed the large characters and in-your-face action. SNK loved mixing genres in those days, and this one includes elements from a few different styles of game. You can attack enemies with your fist and feet, or you can break out the knives and guns for something a bit quicker. This isn't your typical on-rails action like most games of its type. You actually control where you go, and there is a bit of exploration to be done. Some rooms have weapons to find, and some can heal you. The only thing I disliked about it was that it punished you for using your knife too much, making the attacks weaker. Outside of that, it was a great looking and sounding game that really excelled in the arcade scene. If you like action games that require fast reflexes and never lets up, this one should appeal to you quite a bit. SNK also wanted to get in on that sweet, sweet run-and-gun action, so Cyberlip was born. The Earth is under attack from android and alien forces, and of course only two people can stop it. Because of the co-op gameplay, this got a lot of play when it showed up at my local Food Lion. It had some great boss fights, the story was a mix of James Cameron films, and it played just like some of my favorites from Konami and Sega. It does get repetitive after a while and lacks that hook that the better games in the genre have, but it's fun while it lasts. The graphics themselves aren't the best, but some of those boss fights definitely had my jaw on the floor a few times. Metal Slug and Shock Troopers would replace it as the go-to Neo run and gun, but this can still be fun for you and a friend. It's really easy to think Puzzled here is just a simple Tetris clone. I mean, looking at it, it's damn near identical. There are a few important differences, however. First, the entire point is to rescue the little dude at the bottom of the screen. He is trapped and must be freed before the screen fills up with blocks. When you complete a line, the entire structure above drops down, making things a bit confusing at first. Once you get the hang of it, though, there are lots of different puzzles to play and some get really challenging. There are loads of puzzle games on the Neo, but this one is actually one of the more unique ones. I loved League Bowling from the moment I first played it. Fast, fun, and easy to understand, it's got multiple modes to enjoy and up to four players can compete against one another. The graphics are simple, but again, I really enjoyed the scaling effect, so I was fine with them. I still play this one on my MVS from time to time and can even get my wife and daughter to play with me. There is a simple appeal here that will capture the attention of just about anyone with an interest in bowling. No overly complicated power meter, no time-consuming menus to click through, just pick your ball and play. It was a simpler time, and this one is one of my favorites to waste an afternoon on. You may have noticed something about the early Neo Geo games I covered here. There isn't a single traditional fighting game among them. The early lineup on the machine was varied and full of different genres to explore. Fatal Fury didn't show up until the end of 1991, after the explosive success of Street Fighter II. Once World Heroes and Art of Fighting landed in 1992, the deluge of fighting games had begun. No doubt many of those fighting games are incredible, but I still kinda enjoyed the early days of the Neo for what they were. SNK was making lots of different games and many of them were quite decent. When the Neo came home in 1991 as the AES, I wanted one so bad I could taste it. SNK ran an aggressive advertising campaign, basically stating you sucked if you didn't have their games. They even marketed the AES as a 24-bit machine, one that absolutely destroyed the other home consoles in comparison. The problem was is that while I could afford the hardware with a bit of saving, the cost of the games were way outside my pay grade. 
to support the Neo, I needed to abandon my Genesis and Super Nintendo, and that just wasn't going to happen. It wouldn't be until years later that I finally got an MVS of my own, and these days, I use a flash cart with a consoleized unit. Many of the games I covered here still get played from time to time, a testament to their quality and appeal. As the Neo Geo aged, its games came out on much larger cartridges, and the graphics, sound, and animation improved incredibly. Many classics would be born thanks to SNK's mighty arcade at home philosophy, something I kinda wish Sega had copied to some extent with its hardware. I'm Sega Lord X, thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.